our lace will kind of come through a little bit. So we wanna make sure that we cover up those divots there as well so that we don't have any holes where bacteria may hide in case we do use this for food display. It's very important. Let's get our sides here. Because blame, right? Jenny, okay, Jenny and Spencer and Gray. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight. or less we're going to be starting if we can find a seat. Here. Bishop. Conwell. Gray. Hairston. Harsh. House. Jones. Casey. Moore. McCormack. Mooney. Palencic. Santana. Slife. Spencer. Starr. You have a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. Would everyone please rise for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, 
indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice yeah. for all. Madam Clerk, please dispense with the journal. By Council Member Spencer, that the reading of the minutes of the last meeting be dispensed with the journal approved, seconded by Council Member Mooney. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. We'll now move to public comment. I would like to remind all of the speakers to please acknowledge your time in front of you. You have three minutes, and then uh, we will be moving on. And I'd ask all council members to turn your chairs to face the speakers. First up, we have Reveler Pamela M. Pinckney Butts from Ward 6, and she's here to talk about community concerns and other matters, and she's representing global engagement dissolving violence against women and children. Reverend Pinckney Butts. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, to each of you assembled here this evening, I'm Reverend Pamela M. Pinckney Butts. And I had written some things down that I'd like to say to you, but I'm going to have to take it another way like a preacher would have to do. Um, I'm the pastor of and the visionary of No Fear But God Fellowship Assembly uh, Church Ministries as well as others. But today I come in the capacity of also being the founder and visionary of global engagement dissolving violence against women and children, which is a very gigantic epidemic taking place in these days and times. I'm here today to speak with you, not only as an eyewitness regarding this topic of violence against women and children, a lesson taught or shown to me from someone else, or as mere hearsay in the court of law, but as an overcomer of it myself. I reported the abuse of my children and me to the proper authorities. My children confirmed it, as well as the abuses that they came to me and reported that were taking place in my efforts for us to be safe. And we had a protection order in place, and it got violated. Misinformation has been generated to stop this from being corrected. And Therefore, we ended up with a, a domino effect that caused much turmoil, not just in Cleveland, not just in Ohio, but across this nation. And even law enforcement and even the perpetrator for the protection order violated the order. I have a current protection order that I brought, excuse me, I brought with me this evening, as you see, that is still violated. And I, I said this to say not to throw stones at anyone. Because this protection order process, I ask that you legislators would please begin to draft legislation that makes sense, that is compliable for the, and compliant with the police to make us safe. This is a giant in the land that's impacting not only uh, a day-to-day -day situation, but these violences took place in our home, in the academic setting, and many other community components that we were supposed to be safe and secure here in the United States of America. We can go into gender barriers, we can go into racial barriers, we can go into economic barriers, we can go into religious barriers, but this epidemic impacts absolutely every life. I'm asking you legislators to please begin to draft legislation that will make sense, that will be compliant, that will make us safe and secure. Time. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Pinkney. <laughs> Next, we have uh, James Jerome Bell from Ward 6 to talk about Cleveland's renaissance, and he is here just as a resident. Mr. James Jerome Bell. Hello, Council. My name is James Jerome Bell, and I am a real estate practitioner, but I am not here at, in that capacity. I'm in the capacity of trying to lift up not only my community, but my city, because I see the hopefulness, I see the vision, and I also see where we've been. At one time, Cleveland was the richest city in the world with 68 of the world's first 100 millionaires. I believe that that spirit, 
that ingenuity and that can-do spirit is still here. It's through uh, industries like medicine, uh, science, and global realization that we can move forward to truly make Cleveland what it ought to be. I realize that we have things like crime, uh, lead poisoning, and so many other things that can derail us as a community. But I stand here not only as a proud citizen, but as a proud Clevelander, because I truly believe that together we can make Cleveland what it ought to be. A, a city inviting, a city that truly welcomes all people of all backgrounds, talents, and we can make city a major, major city once again, uh, eligible for so many uh, fundings from the federal government, but we also can rise and stem the tide of ignorance. We can stem the tide of injustice, and we can move forward and make Cleveland what it ought to be, a city, a first-class city, a 21st century city in which we have commerce, community, and capability all forging ahead to make Cleveland a new era city in a contemporary America for all to behold. And thank you. Hold on. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Next, we have uh, Anastasia Vanisco from Ward 15, and she, um, Ward 14, and she's here to talk about decriminalization of fair evasion, and uh, she's representing herself. We can Ms. see Vanisco. the clock. Say that again. The clock. Hello, um, good evening. My name is Anastasia Vanesco. I'm currently a resident of Ward 14, but I'm about to move to Ward 15. Um, I'm here to encourage council to propose and pass legislation that would decriminalize fair evasion and to share a personal story of how I've witnessed the impact of these policies. Um, so the story I'm about to tell does pl take place in 2016, so I want to note that this exact scenario shouldn't happen today, um, thanks to a Cleveland judge who found that RTA's method of enforcing the fair evasion ordinance was unconstitutional, and RTA can no longer use armed cops for proof of payment fair enforcement. However, the people most impacted by this policy remains the same, so that's why this story is still relevant. So in the summer of 2016, I was riding the health line back home after work. At the stop at East 79th and Euclid, the bus was boarded by transit police who proceeded to check almost everyone's bus tickets. I say almost everyone because um, out of a bus that was packed with people on the commute back home from work, I was one of, I was the only person who didn't get my um, ticket checked. And I was also one of only two white people on this bus. And when I looked at the officers getting off the bus, I saw that there was a group of people near them that they looked like they were guarding who was almost entirely elderly black folks. So it's people my grandfather's age or older that had been removed from the bus and were now at risk of 30 days in jail or a $250 fine for not buying a bus ticket. And that's just not right. And taking the police out of this picture doesn't get rid of the systemic racism that is inherent in any fair evasion ordinance. Excuse me, sorry. And that is certainly a step in the right direction, though, don't get me wrong. Um, this ordinance is a law that gives people that look like me the benefit of the doubt while disproportionately targeting my BIPOC neighbors. As long as we're enforcing this law, that was going to be true no matter who we're asking to enforce it. Um, legislation to decriminalize fair evasion has been ready for passage since 2019. Writers can't wait any longer, and we shouldn't be asking them to. I urge you to decriminalize fair evasion in Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Robin Goist from Ward 7, and she's here to talk about decriminalization, fair evasion, and she's representing herself. Good evening. 
Tonight, I'm so honored to have my voice join the chorus of Cleveland residents calling on you to decriminalize fare evasion, or non-payment of fare on RTA. I am now the 12th person that you have heard week after week come to this mic. So you've heard over the past few months many of our talking points, and surely you have recognized this as a priority campaign among transit riders and advocates. So with all due respect, I'm asking you, why are you still waiting? What more do you need? What arguments are you still waiting to hear? As you know, under the current fare evasion law, a bus ticket that costs $2.50 runs someone the risk, if for non-payment, runs someone the risk of 30 days in jail and a $250 fine. And meanwhile, for those of us who are privileged enough to have access to a personal vehicle, the equivalent of that, a parking ticket, no one would ever conceive of throwing someone in jail for a parking ticket. That inconsistency itself is unjust, which is why legislation was introduced in 2019 to decriminalize fare evasion. Also in 2019, we learned at a City Club event about a CMSD student who was charged with non-payment of fare. He didn't follow up with the courts on that, and so it ended up in a $5,000 warrant for his arrest. Luckily, he happened to be the mentee of CMSD CEO Eric Gordon, who stepped in and intervened, and thank goodness he did, because otherwise that kid, that child, could have ended up in jail. Think of all the consequences long-term that could have had for him. Over a bus ticket? In closing, I leave you with this. What kind of a legal system financially punishes people for being poor? What kind of justice system throws people in jail, weaponizes their poverty against them for the crime of being poor and needing to get from place to place? What consequences does that have for individuals, for teenagers, with their whole lives ahead of them? What consequences does that have generationally? in a city and county that have declared racism a public health crisis. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make a public comment. I'd like to commend Clevelanders for public comment and members of council who made this possible because instituting a public comment period was the right thing to do. And decriminalizing fair evasion is also the right thing to do. Thank you. James Meerdink, Lakewood, completing, completing Green Streets, and he's with the American Heart Association. Good evening, Council President Griffin and Council members. I'm James Meerdink with the American Heart Association. Uh, I want to address the Complete Streets Bill that we hope will be introduced tonight. Um, we're committed to advancing health equity, which can exist only when all people have the opportunity to enjoy healthier lives. For this reason, we support Complete Streets. All residents should have the ability to feel safe and be active in Cleveland. The path to a complete streets bill that better serves the community has been a long one. A big thanks to Councilman McCormick uh, for his leadership throughout the process and to advocates like Bike Cleveland, also to city planning for seeing the process through. Uh, we're pleased with the progress made on the legislation, including important steps taken to improve transparency and community engagement around transportation decisions that have an impact on all of us. We do see one opportunity to improve the bill by including specific and explicit equity objectives and actions in the transportation planning process. The Council has demonstrated a commitment to serving those residents most in need beyond the many pieces of legislation passed to this effect and your daily work with constituents. Uh, there's the resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis passed in 2020 as a prime example of this body's commitment. The administration has also sent a strong signal in his transition plan in the equity framework, framework, Mayor Bibb states that every decision, personnel, programmatic, or policy should be made with an equity lens. The plan also recommends that we view accessible transportation as a critical way of remedying inequities. The Smart Growth America report on the best complete streets policies that was included among the intro introduction materials states, no longer will it be possible to pass a robust policy that doesn't also consider how to more equitably distribute the benefits of safer streets. 
So the directions are clear. Let's keep equity front of mind as we plan our transportation system, especially as we chart future investments in sidewalks, bike lanes, crosswalks, as these are the elements that provide options to those who are most in need. The current legislation should explicitly state a commitment to equity in the implementation of complete streets. It should create an inclusive vision for transportation infrastructure across all wards and should include specific performance measures to alert us if certain neighborhoods or vulnerable users are being underserved or underconnected. We look forward to working with Transportation and Mobility Chair McCormick and Council members to make this happen. Beyond that, we look forward to passage of this bill and the benefits it will bring to all who use the transportation system in Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, next up we have Kelly Morris from Ward 9 to talk about parking for council meetings. Thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Kelly Morris and I live in Ward 9. It's Kelly with the IE. Today I came out because I could not resist the opportunity to park on the upper deck. And we should have had balloons. I see Ms. Britt, we should have had balloons. We've been talking about this for many, many years. This is a celebration of a task that we've had on board for quite some time. It was in 2015 that my council person, Kevin Conwell, and I met with Mrs. Scalish, and I shared with them that access to city council is not as equitable as she may have thought because citizens of the residents of the city of Cleveland were being required to pay for parking. And of course then people would say, you could park in front of the building. And there are about six or seven parking spaces quite possibly and not really any other access to parking unless you park up on 9th Street which someone who came out to public comment shared he had parked on 9th Street and I thought to myself, this really needs to be addressed. So I come just to say thank you to all of those who worked on this. I want to thank Patricia Britt for keeping us abreast of the progress. I thank President Griffin, who I understand brought this to Chief Teowin. And I thank Mayor Bibb for the commitment to accountability and transparency. But I do note that this is not an ordinance. This is a policy, and I understood the term to be um, a gesture, I think was term that was used towards those citizens who live in the city of Cleveland and choose to drive to city council. But public, order, public comment and parking should be not at the whim or feeling of any person who was in charge at any time. So those are my comments for today. But as I do have the mic, and ironically, that young lady just quoted a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, who says, the time is always right to do what is right. And so I look forward to the ordinance presented by Carrie McCormick, because I think they've quoted you as being the person who's going to present that legislation for the decriminalization. I do stand in support with them as well. Have a great evening. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Next up, we have Andre Daly from Ward 8, and he's here to talk about racism is a public health crisis, and he's representing himself as a constituent and resident. Is Mr. Daly here? Is Mr. Daly here? I don't see Mr. Daly. I'll move to the next person. The next person is Mark W. Schumann from Ward 3, and he's here to talk about legislation being introduced designating a baseball field at Maplewood Park as Martin J. Sweeney Field, and he's representing himself. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I, yeah, I, I'm a... Uh... Mr. President, members of council, all my friends in Cleveland, yes, I'm Mark W. Schumann. I don't represent anyone. I'm just some guy on Dearborn Avenue over in the pointy corner of Ward 3, and I'm here to talk about Ordinance Number 372. This is uh, the one honoring Martin J. Sweeney at the baseball field. And who can forget, who here can forget Martin J. Sweeney? 
The way he worked with city council over the years, and especially the dynamic, eloquent way in which he left this body as president. He used words like irrelevant and pathetic. That was kind of cool. We don't usually discuss, uh, we don't debate, debate plaques and congratulations and motions of acknowledgement, but I think this time we need to make an exception because of the amazing contributions Marty has made to the political culture here. Uh, it, it's going to be hard to contain his greatness in three minutes, but I'll try. Let's go back to 2009. Marty did not admit wrongdoing or liability in response to a sexual harassment complaint by the clerk of council. And it was supported by other staff members. Nothing about this event got anywhere near criminal court, civil court, and it was settled for cash. So basically, I think we can all agree that it was not as bad as Louis C.K., right? He wasn't convicted of anything. And in 2014, Marty resigned from council just in time to qualify for a public pension so he could double dip and be reappointed to the same seat. And he fulfilled that four-year duty to the best of his ability for a couple of months before moving along to the state, before moving along to the state house and accomplishing like a lot of things that I don't really have time to, yeah, yeah. What I'm getting at is this. Marty's not so popular on this side of the bar. He's more popular on that side of the bar because of how much he's done for the people on that side of the bar. He's at your fundraiser. He makes some connections. He's there for you when progressives show up to ruin things. He pays for consulting. Uh, when Cleveland's leadership faces a crisis of credibility, Marty made sure that everything stayed the same. So, Mr. President, your immediate predecessor here, he had some shortcomings. He was not good at being corrupt, but Marty. So, um, I just want to say in closing, there are those that would say that Marty Sweeney might not be deserving of this honor. Thank you. That ends public comment. Madam Clerk, please share communications. There are no communications. All right. Uh, seeing no communications, condolence resolutions. Resolutions of condolence by Council Member Starr for Georgia Linda Houston Thomas. Any other condolences? Seeing no other condolences, will Council Member please rise for a moment of silence. Thank you. Congratulatory resolutions. Resolutions of congratulations by Council Member Griffin for William P. Jones III, by Council Member House for Cleveland Amateur Boat Building and Boating Society Open House, by Council Member House for Lexington Bell Community, Community Center Pre for CLE Early Learning Spaces. Resolutions of recognition by Council Member Griffin for Imam Ayem. Abizid. Abizid. By Council Member Griffin for Imam Masood Ahmad Laria. By Council Member Griffin for um, Imam Abbas Ahmad. By Council Member Griffin for Imam Watuaf A. Shahid. By Councilman, by Council Member Griffin for Bashir Jones. All right. Thank you. We're going to have a couple of presentations. Um, the first person I would like to bring up, if we could bring up Dr. Charles Modlin for a brief moment. Uh, he wants to talk to us about the minority men's health fair. I'm going to ask if uh, members of council can open up the well for Mr. Modlin. And Councilman uh, Conwell and Councilman Slife, would you please join Mr. Modlin at the uh, microphone as he talks about minority men's health month, being the chair of the health committee. And also if uh, Councilwoman Santana, because we know that that's in uh, the metro health area. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Charles Martin. He's been pushing men health 
for 18 years. A lot of men don't like to go to the hospital. They don't like to go to the doctor to see the doctor. But this brother here has been out there working to bring uh, males to the hospital. And you have saved a yeah, matter of fact, you're my doctor, too. <laughs> <laughs> you, when I was dealing with cancer, you were, you were good, man. I just looked at you. But uh, you have saved a lot of men's lives, a lot. And so we, you got to give them a round of applause once again, and we'll yield to you about that. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, Mr. President and uh, City Council, Mayor, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to be here this evening. Actually, there's somebody very important that I have to acknowledge uh, in the audience, Dr. Karen Cooper. Uh, she was at my side for many years at, at Cleveland Clinic when we conducted this Minority Men's Health Fair. Um, but I wanted to um, announce that we're going to have, have another opportunity um, to have a Minority Men's Health Fair over at the Metro Health Medical System. Uh, where I practice now as a, as a surgeon and urologist. It's going to be Thursday, April the 28th, uh, between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. We call it the Minority Men's Health Fair. In actuality, it's actually open to all men, regardless of race or ethnicity. Uh, but we specifically are reaching out and trying to engage men of color because men of color are the group most commonly affected by a number of chronic health conditions, health care disparities, health inequities. Um, that we refer to some examples are higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, a number of cancers, prostate cancer in particular, is, which is something I diagnose and treat is more prevalent, actually twice, um, more, twice as common in, in black men, men of color, uh, compared to their Caucasian American counterparts, twice uh, the incidence of death rates from prostate cancer. All of these healthcare disparities actually culminate in about a four to six year shorter life expectancy compared in, in black men compared to their white male counterparts. Again, it's open to all men, regardless of race or ethnicity. In fact, we will have a number of women also take advantage of these free preventative health screenings. We're actually offering over 30 health screenings. We're going to have every uh, type of clinical specialist available um, to, to provide for free preventative health examinations. We're going to have outside organizations provide information about social services. So again, Thursday, April the 28th, we're going to be at three simultaneous Metro Health locations at our main campus on West 25th Street. We're going to be at our Cleveland Heights branch and also our Slavic Village, Brooklyn, um, <clears throat> or actually Broadway, excuse me, Broadway location. So again, it's a free opportunity. Please uh, encourage the men from your wards, your districts to attend. Um, each year we diagnose a number of cases of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and kidney disease. So thank you for allowing me to be here uh, to announce this wonderful opportunity for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madeline. Thank you. You know, you know Dr. Madeline, say this real quick. A lot of times when people, they think about just themselves, but when you deal with diabetes and when you deal with cancer, and when the doctor tell you that you have cancer, you go in the back room and you cry. But what you cry, it's not just about you, it's about your family and friends. You see weddings, you see Fourth of July, you see Christmas, you see the meaning of these things. It's not just about you, it's about your family. So take this flyer and this information and you give it to your loved ones. And that's very, very important. Thank you, doctor, and God bless. Thank you. All right, thank you. The other presentation, I'm going to ask if uh, Director uh, Stevenson can bring all of the street outreach workers uh, to the well. And all the street outreach workers, you know who you are, many different organizations. And I ask if the council members can please open up the uh, well for the uh, street outreach workers that will be attending. As they come forward, just to make sure that everybody recognizes um, one of the reasons that we're doing this, we lost a very near and dear friend of all of ours who worked closely with us in the street outreach space for quite, quite some time. His name was Carlos Williams. And uh, one of the things that in talking with this network of uh, men and women, we really wanted to honor all of the work of the street outreach work teams that really work hard to try to keep our community safe. Just so that you know, these men and women that you're seeing come up front um, are people who we call 
when we don't always need a uniform response, when we just need everyday people to really go and interact with young people wherever they're at in whatever station of life that they're in. So with that being said, I'm going to have uh, Pastor Stevenson uh, make a couple of remarks, and then uh, he can announce the different groups and the different folks that are here with us today. All right. Uh, thank you, Council President. To um, President Griffin and to Council, to our Mayor, Mayor Bibb, um, I want to thank you, first of all, for thinking about these uh, young men and young women who have been on the streets of Cleveland doing this wonderful work for so such a, a long time. Uh, Mayor Bibb and to the new administration, I want to bring your attention to all of these young men and these young ladies who who go out each and every day in the streets of the city of Cleveland from, from east side to west side, from north to south, um, trying to engage young people to keep them connected to resources, to allow them opportunities that they might not receive anywhere else, but they take the opportunity to do that. And because of the loss of one of our soldiers, one who had put in countless hours trying to help keep the streets of Cleveland safe, and uh, President Griffin saw an opportunity to come down and tell all of these people, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you do each and every day in our streets. And I know a lot of you don't get recognition, but today we want to recognize you. We want to thank you for that awesome work that you do. We want, that's right. to City Council and to Mayor Bibb. These are the men and women who work every day, some getting paid, some not getting paid, but out on the streets each and every day. And I'm just going to recognize a couple of the organizations because I don't know all of them. And I'm going to bring each one of them to the mic to have a couple minutes to address you all. So please be patient with us as we work through this process. So first we want to have uh, chain seekers uh, to come up. And I, I believe... Uh, uh, Hank Davis is going to speak on behalf of Chain Seekers. Good evening. Um, uh, my name is Hank Davis. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Chain Seekers, but I'm also the founder um, and director of Icons. Um, so I just want to say, first of all, thank you guys for having us down here. Um, it's an honor. Thank you for recognizing us um, and the things we do, and also for Carlos. Um, we, like he said, we lost one of our brothers. Um, win, lose, or draw, he was in the field with us for years, um, deep in the trenches. And there's a lot of people here that's been doing this for a long time with us, and some new people. You know, so on behalf of myself, chain seekers, icons, and everything, I also want to say um, to all the brothers and sisters here, man, thank y'all for y'all service. I appreciate y'all, man. Um, and hopefully, man, uh, we can make a change in this city, man, help these kids in our community. All right, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Maisha Crow from, um, Amer I'm, I'm sorry, Peace Peacemakers Alliance. Maisha. Hi, everyone. Council President, City Council, my name is Maisha Crow, and I'm the Executive Director of Cleveland Peacemakers Alliance. Um, I wanted to address you all today, but I'm going to pass the mic to one of my outreach staff, um, Crisis and Deployment Team. His name is Antonio McMullen, and he'll be able to explain the work that we do. Good evening, Council Members. Uh, my name is Antonio McMullen, and I'm here. I represent the Division of uh, Outreach. Uh, so a lot of work that we do is some of the things that everyone else here does. We try to make Cleveland safer. Uh, we notice that we can't do it by ourselves, so we need everyone to chip in, whatever the division is, whatever your, your strength is. You know, we need to just come together and make sure that our, our, our communities are safer. We notice that murders are still up, robberies, rapes, and, and, the, and the community is feeling unsafe. And the, and the question that I'm hearing is, what are you guys doing about it? Everything we can, everything we possibly can, but we can't do it alone. So that's it for me. I thank you. Have a good one. 
Uh, next to the mic, I'm going to call up a young man that I know most of you all know without any introduction, but um, I would call him the godfather of um, street outreach work. Uh, he's been doing this for many, many, many years. Uh, one of the best at, at uh, doing this work, and he's also a City of Cleveland employee. I'm going to call Mr. James Box for American to the mic. Good evening to everyone, council members, the mayor, uh, all the street outreach workers behind me, and Jihad over there, outreach worker as well. Only thing I want to say this evening is that we lost a good soldier, uh, Carlos Williams. I actually mentored him when he was a young teenager and got him involved in this work. Probably the majority of the people behind me that, that dealt with me came through my tutelage in terms of doing this street outreach work. And I don't, I don't say that or take that lightly because God blessed me with a talent to be able to reach people, especially young people. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. One of our primary goals is to reach the young, hard-to-serve population in our city to reduce some of the homicides that take place in our city on a daily basis and to find missing and exploited people, young people. Uh, actually, I talked to a mom this past week. I met with her. Her daughter was Adriana Barnes that was found on um, Warner Road. She told me she saw her daughter. Her daughter was nothing but a bag of bones. The people that murdered her put lie or something on her to burn the skin off her body in, in hopes of trying to conceal it, I guess. But she was, she was very, she called me, she was very, th wanted to pay me money, and we don't take money for this because we do this from our heart because there's so many young people out here that's coming up missing and coming up dead. But one of the things that Jim Brown did, he invested in me, and he taught me everything about himself in terms of how to do this work out here in the streets, and that with my experience as a minister and as an evangelist to go into the highways and hedges to compel God's people to come in. I couple that with American to have a more impactful pre presentation to young people and adults because all of us are out here hurting. Our city is in a state of emergency. Our young people out here are fatherless. They're hurting. They need help. They need help more than just what you see in front of us. You see, we have the ability to go out there and reach them on a level in which they can understand us because we come from where they come from. Some of us have been to prison. Some of us sold dope. Some of us have been out here hustling on the street. You dig what I'm saying? So we can identify with them. You see, Paul in the Bible said he became all things unto all men that he might win some. So that's what the people around me, we all do that same thing. But then there's the part, the fiscal part, the financial part, because nobody out here wants to work for free. Everybody wants to be compensated for their value, and their value, everybody behind me and around me has value. But the young people that we deal with on a daily basis, they have value too that's been unestimated. You dig what I'm saying? We look at them like they're thugs and criminals because nobody sees their value, but we see their value, and we need other people from a financial perspective to be able to fund programs and, and institutions and organizations that have the ability to go into the, to the grassroots parts of our city and snatch these young people out and put them in programs that's going to help them become taxpayers and not tax takers, productive members of our society. And so with that... I'm going to say this before I close. I want to sit down and talk with our illustrious mayor, Mr. Bibb. Your grandmother grew up across the street from me on Dub. So me and you need to have a conversation because as of today, tomorrow I'm resigning from the city of Cleveland because I have to do the work that God called me. I can't sit back no more and watch our young people be murdered senselessly in the street and then we come and clap hands and, and we applaud each other over nothing. We're not making no impact. It's time for impact. And I'm going to show you how it's supposed to be done tomorrow. So, um, again, I want to I wanna thank the council president for allowing us to come. But before we close, I don't know how to hang this back up here, but before we close, um, a lot of you know that the Department of Community Relations also has an outreach team. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We also have an outreach team that does this work every day. Um, they come in and, and, and they go out and they answer calls 24 hours a day um, for priority one calls. And Someone you got a preacher got to have a, a council member to fix a mic for him, right? So we um, 
we are thankful that you have allowed us, Mr. Mayor, to uh, continue this work from the Department of Community Relations. So before we close, I just want to call Mr. Simmons up, our, our outreach supervisor, just to address council and to the administration. Jacques. Good afternoon, council, council president, mayor of the city of Cleveland. I want to first start with a pause for our fallen soldier. I met Carlos over 30 years ago in a situation like what we're dealing with today. I had just moved into the 116th area in Soika from Cedar Central. Carlos was an individual, you know, that hung on Imperial. And because of where I came from, some of the individuals in the area didn't want me around there. Carlos stepped in and mediated that situation over 30 years ago before he became an outreach worker. So his heart from the beginning was in helping people. Fast forward 30 years later, and we're in the same space doing the same work, trying to bridge the gap between our generation and the generation that we see spiraling, spiraling out of control today. But it's not just their fault. It's not the youth fault that we see, you know, spiraling out of control. We could push blame to them, the household. We could push blame to them not having education. We could push blame to them just not being <laughs> educated or properly raised but let's push blame where it really is. Guns. 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 I could say it a hundred more times. Guns. Everybody in this room could say it a hundred more times. Guns. And we still have more guns than what we could say on the streets of Cleveland today. The access to guns is one of the biggest problems that we have within our city. And yet, and still, we create laws to allow people to carry more guns. If you don't have the guns, you don't have the homicides. If you don't have the ammunition to load the guns, you don't have the shootings. So I don't come to, you know, uplift the outreach workers. We already doing what we can do. As Antonio said, we out here and we're doing everything. We're giving it our all on a daily basis. We're inside homes. We're inside prisons. We're inside schools. We're inside recreation centers, giving our all. I've been in neighborhoods that I have no ties to, giving my all, just as well as those standing here with me. But unless, until we have people that will step in and say, we're going to do something about gun control, we're going to continue to have homicides, violence, and things that plague our city. And it's not just in Ward 1, it's in Ward 9, 10, 13, 2, 5, and wherever else that we travel throughout the city. It's not on just the doorsteps of the areas that were dilapidated or, you know, falling apart, so to speak. It's in every area now. It's in Shaker, it's in Maple, it's in Beechwood. It's everywhere. So until we have gun control laws, we will continue to have violence. But yet and still, our outreach workers will still be here trying to fight and do what we can to ensure that we have a safe city. That's right. Thank you. Before I turn it back into the hands of the council president, we have a young man here that is a participant of one of the programs who we're going to give a couple minutes to say something. So. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get your name. Jabari? Jabari is going to come and address you at this time. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jabari. Um, this Peacemaker program really helped me. I was a bad kid, hanging with gang members to the point it took me to the courts to get shot. And ever since, I've been in the program, been helping me, keeping me out of trouble trying to find the right job, the right career for me to go. 
Yeah. It's my work here back here. Uh, how you guys doing? My name is uh, Andre Taylor. I'm his uh, he's my participant in the uh, Peacemakers program. Uh, this kid that came a long way. All right. All right. So just to close out, first of all, on behalf of Cleveland City Council, I want to thank all of you. I know the work personally that all of you have done. I've worked closely with all of you for years. Um, just for council to know, it started out with uh, me, Pastor Stevenson, and James Box. And this uh, network has ballooned to what we see it is today. So on behalf of all Cleveland City Council, it really hit me when Carlos passed away. I know how much he meant to me as a personal friend as well as all of you. And ladies and gentlemen, um, when you're having trouble in parks, when you're having trouble in recreation centers, when you're having trouble in streets, this is the group you should really make sure you engage. Uh, they have stopped more crime from happening and have stopped more bodies from dropping than anybody can imagine in the city of Cleveland. And people do not get an opportunity to really know um, how, they, how they operate. I also think that he's here, and I don't think he's up here right now, but Khalid Samad is also um, a very, very active member who is um, another OG of this uh, group. So I just want to make sure that I thank uh, Luis, Khalid, and all of the other folks that are not here, too. So thank you, guys, and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, Madam Clerk, first reading emergency ordinances referred for administrative review and committee review. Ordinance 369-2022 by Council Members Casey and Griffin by departmental request <clears throat> to amend sections 1A, 2A, 10, 11, and 12 of Ordinance 1368-15 relating to constructing the new pump station and elevated water tower, installing water mains, and making related site improvements as components of the boosted third high system in Richfield, Ohio. Ordinance 370, 2022, by Council, members, by Council Member McCormack and Mayor Bibb, to provide for the evaluation of complete and green street elements in the city-sponsored transportation pro uh, projects within the public right-of-way, and to repeal Ordinance 798-11, passed September 19, 2011. Ordinance 371, 2022, by Council Members Hairston and Griffin by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Community Development to conduct an exterior paint program to enter into one or more written agreements with homeowners and tenants as incentive to maintain the exterior of their homes by providing exterior paint and paint supplies through participating vendors and in limited circumstances the necessary labor needed to prepare and paint the homes and authorizing the purchase by one or more standard and requirement contracts of paint, paint materials and supplies necessary to implement the exterior paint program including labor. Ordinance 372-2022 by Council Member Slife, designating Field 4 at Maplewood Park as Martin J. Sweeney Field. Ordinance 373-2022 by Mayor Bibb and Council Members Gray and House to supplement the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio by enacting new sections 162.0102 and 03 relating to the creation of the Commission on Black Women and Girls. Ordinance 374, 2022, by Council Members Bishop and Griffin, by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Public Works to execute a deed of easement and a deed of temporary easement, granting to Cuyahoga County Department of Public Works certain easement rights and property needed for the Warrensville Center Road Bridge Rehabilitation Project adjacent to Shaker Lakes Park, and declaring the easement rights not needed for the city's public use. 
Ordinance 375, 2022, by Council Members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Public Works to enter into contract with the Northeast Ohio Muni Football League, AKA Cleveland Municipal Football Association, DBA Cleveland Muni Football League, to conduct a citywide youth football program. Ordinance 376, 2022, by Council Member Griffin, determining the bid of APG office furnishings for judges, chairs, council chambers is the lowest and best bid and authorizing the clerk of council to enter into a written requirement contract with APG office furnishings for these items. Ordinance 377, 2022, by council members McCormack and Griffin by departmental request authorizing the purchase by one or more requirement contracts of installing, maintaining, relocating, refurbishing, and repairing city-owned passenger boarding bridges used at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport for the Division of Airport Department of Port Control. Ordinance 378, 2022, by Council Member Griffin, authorizing the Clerk of Council to enter into a contract with Patterson Pope, Inc. to purchase and install updated electronics for the electric power mobile high density storage systems located at Cleveland City Archives. <clears throat> First reading, emergency resolutions to be adopted. Resolution 379, 2022, by Council Member Spencer, objecting to a new D5 liquor permit at 7934 Lorraine Avenue. Resolution 380, 2022, by Council Member McCormack, objecting to the transfer of ownership of a D2, D2, X, D3 liquor permit to, to 1801 East 9th Street, first floor, suite eight. Read the motion to suspend the rules. By Council Member Spencer, that the rules be suspended and the legislation just read be placed on final passage, seconded by Council Member Mooney. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 16 yeas. Call the roll on adoption. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 16 yeas. Call the roll on adoption. That was it. Oh, that was it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Second reading, emergency ordinances to be passed. Ordinance 147, 2022, as amended by Council Members Palencic and Griffin by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Community Relations to apply for and accept a grant from the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas Juvenile Court Division to conduct the 2022-23 Cleveland Community Diversion Program. Ordinance 209-2022, as amended, by Council Members McCormack, Bishop, and Griffin, by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Public Works to enter into an agreement with Ohio City Incorporated to reestablish and continue to manage programs to benefit the West Side market for a period not to exceed four years. Ordinance 268-2022, by Council Members Conwell, Bishop, and Griffin, by departmental request, authorizing the Director of Public Works to execute a joint use agreement and other required documents to permit the Friends of Carpatho Rusin Cultural Garden of Cleveland to construct improvements at the Carpatho Rusin Garden, AKA Rusin Garden, and to accept funding from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources for this purpose. Read the motion to suspend the rules. By Council Member Spencer, that the rules be suspended and the legislation just read be placed on final passage, seconded by Council Member Mooney. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Harrison, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 16 yeas. Call the roll on passage. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Harrison, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 16 yeas. Thank you. Are there any introductions? Clarification for Councilman Palencic. He's been held, correct? 
242. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, any introductions? Councilman Kevin Conwell. Yeah, I'm my friend, he won a Grammy, one of my best friends, Michael Calhoun from the Dad's Band, Let It Whip. And when you win a Grammy, man, y'all just look at the Grammy, man, I always wanted to win a, win a Grammy. Let It Whip, you hear bands marching around now playing Let It Whip. So you, Louie, and I will meet afterwards, and we'll discuss some other things, but you guys tied with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire, that was really cool, man. I saw you on uh, TV, when was that, 1982, something like that? Yeah, that was cool beans, man. I really dug it. It was really cool. All right, thank you, Michael Calhoun. The former building and housing director, Ayanna Blue Donald Lee. <laughs> she left? Okay, and then also uh, Judge Michael Nelson, is he still here or did he leave? He left, okay. All right, thank you. Um, seeing no more introductions, are there any announcements? Any announcements? Councilwoman Stephanie House. Yes, or who, those who are attending, I would just encourage you during your lunch hour to tune in to Cleveland City Council's Facebook page for the uh, council members who will be doing a conversation on equal pay and what we need to do for economic security um, for women and families in the city of Cleveland. So tune in on Thursday, April 21st at 12, 12 p.m. on our Facebook page. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And I believe you'll be with all of the women members of council, right? So we definitely need to make sure we're there to support that. All right, thank you. Is there any miscellaneous? Councilman Kevin Conwell. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I was just sent this piece Kevin. over here by uh, Angela Woodson. And I thought I was going to be on the, on the female piece, too. You were talking with me about it. Never got me on it, but I understand that. But I'll help you with some funding with it as well. The tenor piece. Don't put that over here. The new house bill combines a 616, which just introduced. It's a dangerous bill. It's similar to Nazism, and it's similar to the Florida don't say gay, and it's prohibit teaching so they say so-called divisive critical race theory. I'm going to study this more and more, and um, I'm sending this around in my ward. We'll probably make thousands of copies and I'll have my team to go door to door to have my residents to call down state, down state in Columbus. Because just me talking on the floor here means nothing. Actions speak louder than words. So we'll talk about it, I'll meet with my people. And then what we will do is have, I'll have my residents call down state to the state legislator to tell them to not accept this bill. This, about this critical, against this critical race theory and what they're pushing. Also, we'll watch it, and when they host committee meetings, as you know, I'll go down state and testify against it, and I have some other people to testify against it. This piece here, when you see it, they talk about critical race theory, and they don't want teachers to teach about 1619 when slavery first started in the United States of America. They don't want us to know about our history and they don't want it to be taught in school. Why can't they stop that with the state reps and state senators? You're my boss and you're their bosses too. How can the state representatives tell you that we can't teach it? People deserve to know about their history and you can't be afraid to fight. If we let this go and we don't go down state to fight, then you'll get more bills and more bills and more bills and more hate bills. You gotta stop it right now. Go on cleveland.com, read it, and when we go down state, I need other council members to go down there with me and tell their residents to go down there also. Now, I watched Kasich on, uh, on TV. He said critical race theory make white folks feel guilty and it make African Americans feel as victims. That's what he said. You don't have to look at the history, it's going on right now. 
When you look at our, na our neighborhoods and you see redlining, when you see African Americans being arrested and pulled over by police officers in the community walking while black, driving while black, when you see African Americans that can't get jobs because they are African Americans, what are they talking about history? It's going on right now. But you got to fight it and you got to fight it now. Look. I just had a grandson born March 3rd, and if I don't fight and stand up and get out there and not just talk about it, you got to be about it, then little Jackie Robinson, my grandson, will have to deal with that now. So you got to fight it. It's not just being here on the floor. It's going down there. And the governor, I will text him a message, a letter about what he said about victim. If you feel like a victim, then get out there and fight against this critical race theory and fight against this House Bill 616. Fight against it. Actions speak louder than words. He needs to help us with this. We can't just sit by like bumps on a log. So I'm going to write a letter to my residents about this issue, walk door to door, tell them to make phone calls downstate to the governor's office as well as to the state rep's office. Right now, they don't have any co-sponsors, I see. The two individuals that um, wrote the legislation, no co-sponsors. So you got to cut them off at the path. You got to cut them off at the path, and they got to see us down there. They have to see you down there battling and fighting. You know, House. You know, I've seen you down there fighting when we, when we battled against Stand Your Ground Peace down there on the floor. They got to see you because the proof is in the pudding. So I'm going to read this. We'll push it in the neighborhood. I'm going to reach out to a lot of you guys. And Carrie, be nice. You come down there as well. And we fight this thing together. We got to get in the foxhole together and we got to fight this. We can't let this bill go through because they'll push more and more bills and it will get worse and worse. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Richard Starr. Good evening. Um, um, I just want to stand and um, just really commend our leadership when you bring down um, community relations, Peacemaker Alliance, that's when we start talking about what's really going on. First, I would like to say is um, make it on record for Ordinance 375. I know we had a long discussion the last two weeks. Shout out to um, my colleague. Um, Councilmember McCormick, he said we're going to make some amendments to make sure Muni League football have more than just $80,000 for a citywide program. So I wanted to rise tonight to really, really speak on the facts and the truth that's going on in our city. When you hear the violence interrupters, the people that are front line come up here and you look up and say, that's probably everybody that's on in their department, on their staff, in their organizations that's on the front line fighting this gang violence and problems that's going on in the city of Cleveland. But when you look at the reality, I understand you. And I voice our same thoughts. And I tell everyone I've buried more kids than anybody in this body ever did. And that's not something to brag about. It just shows you how bad it is in this city when I'm 33 years old and I have to attend more funerals than anyone else. So what I challenge us to do is stop making it seem like we're doing some work and helping the community relations and Peacemaker Alliance. They need more staff. They need more funding. We have to take a proactive approach with dealing with gun violence in our city. And possibly with that Senate Bill 215 going into law and passing, we got, we got a long summer ahead of us. And what we need to do is figure out what we're going to do with the programs that we are offering in our city. We fund a lot of, well, I'm just saying all right, we fund a lot of programs that suck. We fund, we fund every program that suck, but we don't fund no program that help our youth. Where our youth have more access to guns, we fund programs that I don't even understand, a person that looked like me or from War 5 that even attend. And then we ain't gonna even talk, no, we are gonna talk about it. We got a terrible recreation system, Every rec center in our in the east side looks like a piece of junk. There's no program going on. It's lacking. 
as an expert, I would say an expert 15 years as a youth de development professional, I understand program. You go into our rec centers, they don't got no schedules, they don't got no kids, whether it's 12 o'clock, whether it's 4 o'clock, whether it's 7 o'clock, no matter what, it suck. But everybody get a check every day talking about they saving lives. I've had to bury more kids that got killed on the outside of Lonnie Burton playground than anybody ever could imagine. From not five, from not six, to double digit numbers of youth every summer. But guess what we do? We say we got good program. We have people working in our rec centers that hear what's going on with the kids and the dispute and still allow both parties to walk out. When I was 15 years old, a young boy got killed in front of Lonnie Burton when I was there too. Now at 33 years old, they still getting killed on, at Lonnie Burton, but we still go to work every day saying we're trying. Trying ain't gonna get it cut for Cleveland. And if we don't stand up and figure out solutions as a, together, working with the violence interrupters and giving them the resources that they need as far as staff and funding, we're gonna to continue to be talking about how Cleveland keep ranking high with all the homicides every year. So I just challenge us to really dig up our sleeves, come together, figure out solutions to solve this gun violence that's plaguing our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, I do want to make one more miscellaneous announcement. It is uh, our Ward 12 Council Lady's birthday today, Rebecca Moore. If we could give her a round of applause. <laughs> Rebecca has been great to work with, so happy birthday, Rebecca, and enjoy yourself. <laughs> I see everything. All right. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, please excuse the absence. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman McCormick, you have uh, the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, and I was talking to Councilman Starr. There was a discrepancy between what we budgeted and the ordinance that came through for Muni. So I support uh, the adjustment to that ordinance as well. Um, Mr. President, um, I, uh, two points to, uh, I rise tonight on. First, uh, I want to thank my uh, colleague, Kevin Conwell, for speaking out um, against House Bill 616. Is that what it is, 616? Um, you know, this is a heinous uh, law that in, inserts partisan politics, conservative politics, into our schools across the state of Ohio. Um, it's funny how the party that used to talk about uh, local control and limited government seems to be all up in our hospitals, all up in our doctor's offices, all up in our relationships, and now all up in our classrooms. So uh, it's a huge problem. I support the councilman. Uh, but truly, Mr. Chairman, it's the same, you know, um, the same politics of distracting from what they're doing in other parts with these kind of shiny objects, but nonetheless, uh, very destructive for our community. So thank you, Councilman Conwell, for standing up. As you know, there's kids of all different backgrounds that, you know, when this passes, uh, are going to feel less valued because of this type of legislation, so thank you. Mr. Chairman, I also rise tonight um, to uh, thank you and our body, our research staff, uh, Mayor Jackson's team and the current administration uh, for working on the Complete and Green Streets policy. Uh, we're gonna be learning a lot more about it over the next few weeks as it goes through our committee process and we have more and more conversations about it. Uh, but fundamentally, um, this ordinance will rework the way that we look at roads to ensure that we're having pro active community-based conversations on the front end about how do we design our roads so that they're safer for our children, so that cars can't go 100 miles per hour down, down our roads anymore, so that kids crossing the street have a chance to get to the other side, so that folks that are using um, uh, bikes or other multi-mobility devices are able to safely get to work, get to school, get to the library. For far too long, we have prioritized the vehicle with little accommodation for pedestrian safety for uh, non-vehicular uh, traffic as well. So this ordinance really takes a hard look at how we change a system, how we change a system to be much more thoughtful proactively on the front end of designing our roads for all users while ensuring that we don't strain our resources. And I think that we've done a really good job working together to find that balance. Mr. President, as I've told you, and I'm sure you, you well, I know I hear it from my colleagues, I can't go to one community meeting with people uh, without them complaining about speeding cars, speeding traffic, my neighbor, my kid almost got hit or did get hit, uh, hearing about a, a kid right down the street from me that a couple weeks ago uh, was walking to school with a crossing guard and got hit by a car uh, as she walked across the street. Thank God she'll be okay. 
These are the types of stories, Mr. President, that we hear in all of our community meetings, and I'm so proud of this council. Uh, we've been working on this for a few years. Um, uh, thankful to the mayor for his support on this initiative, but really to think about our families, our neighborhoods, our community members, so that as we move forward designing our roads, they are done so in a safe way that prioritizes our residents, our kids, our schools, our families, to ensure that we have safe roads for all. So as we move through this process, um, again, we're going to learn a whole lot more about this ordinance. I look forward to those conversations. Uh, but really, to me, it's the start of a new day as we take a, a, a giant leap forward as a council uh, to prioritize this important initiative, uh, as well as with uh, working with the mayor's office. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please excuse the absences. By Council Member Spencer, that the absence of Council Member Jones is hereby excused, seconded by Council Member Mooney. Thank you. This council meeting is adjourned to the next regular meeting on April the 25th, 2002. that we've been testing and constructing this year, we will be trying to bring to scale next year as part of a full learner experience. And also another thing that's been implemented this year are the CS Education After School programs. Um, we started with the K through eights. Now, you know, high school is in the works um, starting next school year. But, you know, can you just talk about how this is really helpful for families and for students? I know a lot of them have expressed some stress during this pandemic and returning to school, but to have that outlet um, for after school programs. Yeah, the mental health and physical health needs of all of our community, whether it be our students, uh, you know, our juveniles, our youth, or their adults, um, the need is high. 